All right, so I think we're live. Uh, let us know in the chat if we are. Welcome, everybody. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. So nice to see you all here tonight or this afternoon. Can you see us, hear us? Hey. All right, so welcome to the first lecture of uh, NIM Shipyard. Uh, today I have with me Hoxian, who is my co-host. I'm Sudo, aka Simon. I'm head of community at NIM. It's uh, absolutely lovely to finally kick off Shipyard as far, the, as far as the curriculum is concerned. And of course, I also have with me Harry, uh, NIM CEO and founder. Say hi to the people. Hey, everyone. Glad to see everyone here. Hey, so this is the very first masterclass of Shipyard um, and level one in general is all about the big picture. Uh, so we're going to be keeping it high level for now and to really put things in perspective um, when it comes to Shipyard. Today, we're kicking off with a big picture overview um, with the uh, first master cl masterclass. Uh, Harry will be talking about uh, a problem, uh, a big problem, and also an equally big solution to that problem. So basically, the problem is how the internet is broke, broken today, and the big solution uh, to that is what NIM proposes to fix it. Um, what's your take on this, Hux? Why is um, uh, why does the big picture matter? I think the big picture matters most because it's it's often something overlooked or deemed normal so much so that we don't actually stop and think in order to assess how daunting the situation is, to, you know, regarding our online lives. And before we begin, I'd like to just chime in some practical stuff regarding this live stream. That even that this event is being live streamed both on YouTube and Twitch. The recording will be available on both platforms. The subtitles will be added on YouTube as soon as possible. Uh, we're working very hard on this, so hard on this. So please bear with us. And the translations of Harry's deck today that he's going to be presenting shortly have been shared both on our Telegram and Matrix and Discord channels. And by the way, if you have any questions throughout uh, Harry's masterclass, you can leave them in the Twitch or YouTube chat. You can you also keep an eye on the Matrix channel. So especially for people who, who would like to stay anonymous or preserve their privacy, you know, uh, leave your questions on Matrix and we try to answer them all. For those questions, what we couldn't answer today, make sure to bring them on Friday's AMA with uh, Sudo, Jaya and myself. And uh, let me give the mic back to you, Sudo. Oh, thank you. So uh, let's move on to Harry, actually. First of all, a uh, big thanks for doing this with COVID. Hopefully you're feeling okay. Yeah, I'm a bit congested, but uh, it should be okay. Can't wait to uh, see your masterclass. Now, while people are still uh, joining the uh, uh, the stream, I would like to ask a warm-up question, if that's fine by you. So when talking about privacy with people, we very often get uh, a, a common question. A lot of people are asking this question. I am a good person. I have nothing to hide. Isn't privacy for bad people? So what do you think is the best way to address this uh, this question? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it should be remembered that what people consider good or bad at, at various times can change very rapidly, right? So for example, um, you know, even, even look at the, uh, the, the situation, of course, in, uh, in Palestine right now, right? So people who, you know, think they're being good citizens, either on the Israeli side or the Palestinian side, uh, could be, for example, targeted uh, by the other side due to the metadata that they're producing, even if what they're doing is, you know, totally innocent and legal. And so in general, because you don't know what government will, when the government will change or when, you know, hostile actors will invade your digital sphere and use that information against you, the, the kind of the principle, the precautionary principle to some extent should be implemented, in which case the precautionary principle would be do not leak this kind of metadata or data in the first place um, to possible adversaries. I think that is a great prelude to your presentation. So without further ado, actually, just take it away. Uh, Salazar, please share uh, uh, my screen and then let's go. Yeah, so, you know, I'm the co-founder and currently CEO of, of NIM Technologies, and our mission is uh, to enable privacy for the entire planet. And, um, you know, we've, we're creating a kind of next generation of privacy infrastructure. So this is uh, a MixNet, which was invented by David Chom all the way back in 1979. And we're bringing it into production with some new designs and new theories. And we believe that our technology can indeed protect the patterns of communication for all internet traffic. Uh, next. So for those of you who uh, don't know me, which I imagine is, is most of you, 
um, I, uh, I got my PhD um, back in uh, University of Edinburgh. And I worked mostly actually at that point on machine learning, not cryptography or distributed systems, uh, what we now call artificial intelligence. And, you know, that's one of the things that helped me uh, realize the power of surveillance, uh, how dangerous it was, because with a very little amount of data, you can make vast uh, predictions about people's future behavior. And, you know, I did my PhD back in um, the early 2000s. I uh, got my PhD, I think in 2011 or 12, worked for the inventor of the actual web, the web 1.0, Tim Berners-Lee, trying to fix uh, data and particularly add cryptography with, with the web crypto API to all the browsers that work. We all have working crypto in our browsers now for JavaScript environments. Um, but the problem is that I noticed pretty quickly that there was no real alternative to surveillance by Google or Microsoft or even Apple. Um, and therefore I got kind of excited when I saw Web3 happen because of Web3 said, well, maybe there's an alternative business model for the internet that does not involve mass surveillance, which does involve more sustainable economics and which does involve kind of returning power to the people whose labor actually creates the value of the internet, which is the ordinary people around the world. So how can we make a new kind of internet where we are not simply uh, the victims of surveillance? And, you know, I did work very heavily uh, on cryptography with folks from Google and Apple and Microsoft, and I don't believe it's within their uh, capabilities to fix these problems because their business models, to some extent, involve the capture of your data and surveilling you. And, you know, I'm not just philosophically particularly adverse to advertising. I don't consider that the worst thing that can happen to someone, but I do realize that this kind of mass amount of data collection uh, can be used for behavior control, which is very politically useful and can, and this amount of data, data can also be given uh, to governments to, um, uh, to eliminate political dissent. And that really does worry me. Uh, my data was handed to the UK government due to my climate change activism when I was younger. And that resulted in, uh, and still results in severe harassment. Uh, but what I get uh, is very little compared to what friends of mine like Basil Safadi, a Syrian activist received, who was, uh, because he was leaking metadata via his communications, was captured and uh, tortured to death by, uh, in, in Syria. So, um, yeah, it's a really big deal, and I, I'm glad we're all together here to try to solve it. So next. So there is something which most people don't realize anymore, which is that the Internet is to some extent or to a large extent broken. Um, the Internet essentially reveals all of the data that you're communicating and who you're communicating to by default next so what this means is that every time i turn on my computer the entire planet uh, anyone who's at least interested knows what i'm doing if i'm talking to instagram or if i'm uh, on youtube or if i'm on zoom or if i'm playing a video game they kind of know what i'm doing and if i'm sending email or messaging they they can even determine more or less whom I'm communicating with. Now, some of these problems are solved by encryption. So for example, in your browser, there's a little lock button. If that lock button is on, which it should be on most of the time, that means the content between your computer and the web server on the other side of it is encrypted. And that's a good thing. Uh, that prevents someone from just reading your messages. But what is not encrypted, most people are not aware of this, is the website you are talking to or the server you're talking to or the and the other people talking to that server so that the who is talking to whom uh that data is called metadata data about data that's what the meta means and this leaks even at the network level and even when you're using encryption which includes you know https but also encrypted messaging apps like Signal or uh, zero knowledge based cryptocurrencies like Zcash 
or other kind of private cryptocurrencies like Monero, this data is always leaked. Uh, now, there are some techniques you can use to prevent that leakage. Uh, for example, you could use a VPN. Um, I don't know how many people here use a VPN, but they're very common. Now, VPNs uh, don't, there's some misconceptions about them. We'll go into those shortly, uh, but they don't provide actual anonymity. They don't let uh, the, the person that's running the VPN server knows exactly what you're doing. They know where you're going and who you're talking to because your information is going to them. Centralized VPNs are to some extent dangerous. They may be useful for accessing Netflix overseas, but they just kind of move what we call the trust from your computer to someone else's computer. And I don't know how much you trust them. Uh, decentralized VPNs just do so in a decentralized way. Um, now, one step better than VPNs is Tor. Tor is a kind of decentralized VPN, um, and it's much more trustworthy than any VPN. But it has a problem, which is does not provide anonymity against adversaries that can monitor the whole network. So a reasonably powerful adversary, for example, the NSA, but also in terms of Bitcoin, private companies like Chainalysis and Elliptic, or even other governments, China, Russia, so forth and so on, um, they can monitor all the traffic coming into the, the connection and out of it, including in and out of the Tor network. And that can be used uh, to correlate and attack and de-anonymize uh, traffic going through Tor as well. So Tor is about as good as we get right now, but we know and we should be able to do better. Next. So, I mean, there is an interesting question of would, does anyone care? Uh, now, Fred Wilson from Union Square Ventures, who is a kind of famous venture capitalist, I think he blogs at avc.com. Even he notes that mass surveillance by governments and corporations will become normal and expected in the 2020s, which I think is true. And people will turn to new products and services to protect themselves from surveillance, the biggest consumer technology successes of this decade will be in the area of privacy. And we have seen some success already. DuckDuckGo, which is a kind of anti-Google search engine, is doing really well. ProtonMail, which is a privacy-enhanced alternative to Google, um, to Gmail, to adding features like private calendaring, is doing very well. And my general hypothesis is that the privacy market could be as revolutionary as the advent of encryption, remember the lock in your browser, which means you're using TLS or SSL after the crypto wars for the web. But now a lot of people said that, you know, crypto should be illegal or, you know, governments were pushing for it to become illegal back in the 90s, way before Bitcoin. But the fact of the matter is without encryption of the browser, you couldn't have banking online because uh, sitting, you know, if you sent your... If you sent your internet, if you sent your traffic over an internet connection, um, it could be intercepted by a random guy at the Wi-Fi cafe. If it's not encrypted, and they would get your passwords and whatnot. Uh, we used to do this at a hacker conference called DefCon, and we would put everyone's passwords in the email box and their various services on a screen. So it used to be very easy. Now with encryption, there was a whole new generation of companies like Amazon, eBay, or in China, companies like uh, Alibaba, so forth and so on, that were enabled uh, by essentially privacy technology. So we think, you know, in COVID-19, I think it showed us how dependent we are on the internet for our daily lives. And so the real question we have is, what kinds of new enterprises, endeavors, projects will widespread privacy and anonymity lead to? Next. So the question, though, is does anyone care currently? So it's obviously like maybe in the future people will care, but will anyone care now? Next. Um, so we have seen that a lot of people use Tor. I hope you guys use Tor. I use Tor every day um, and I run a Tor relay. We should all support Tor. Um, the... Uh, it is imperfect, but is the best we have currently for general purpose internet traffic. 
So, you know, we have 20 gigabytes a day going through 6,500 6, nodes. We're at 2 million users. And the growth kind of went up and down, but somewhere between maybe two and six million, kind of unclear. But Signal is an interesting example. Signal used to be very small. I'm quite good friends with Moxie. And I remember back when Signal was thinking of even shutting down in 2016. Like Signal went from a few million users in 2016. And then Trump became elected and it skyrocketed up to tens of millions. And now we believe that Signal may have up to a billion users. That's a huge amount of users. But the problem is that Signal and Tor and a lot of privacy projects are nonprofits, right? So when Trump cut Tor's funding, Tor had to reduce their staff by one third. Signal almost out, ran out of money, but the founder of WhatsApp, who's pro privacy, came in and helped them out and is now CEO. But the real question is can we find a sustainable economic model for privacy? Next. And so I believe the answer is yes, that we can have a sustainable economic model for privacy by taking advantage of the lessons we've learned from, yes, that's my t-shirt, from Bitcoin. Bitcoin has given us a true wealth of economic knowledge that we didn't have before. Next. So what we've done is we've taken this economic knowledge of from we gathered from Bitcoin and, you know, we've applied it to uh, the domain of privacy, in particular, what's called a mixnet. So I'm going to go into what a mixnet is and exactly how it works shortly. But a mixnet is a multi-purpose kind of anonymous over traffic uh, overlay. So it runs, you know, it's, it's, it's a part of but kind of on top of the existing Internet. And its function is to prevent traffic analysis by an adversary an enemy let's say that's capable of watching the entire network and we should you know be capable of resisting traffic analysis from even the most powerful of adversaries including the nsa the um problem is that historically you know if you're running a volunteer network how do you know if the network's actually working. How do you get people to run these servers? And we have a NIM token, which incentivizes privacy. It's used as a reputation token for the nodes in the network. And it makes the MixNet decentralized, sustainable, and resilient. And of course, you know, you're not just sending over packets with the net, you're sending data. So we also have a kind of zero knowledge system called ZK NIMS which allow third-party apps to anonymize any kind of value, uh, key value pairs, if you're familiar with JSON, so that users can privately reveal part or all of their data at their discretion, you know, as necessary for compliance, authentication, or just making the app work. So if I'm, for example, logging into a VPN, like we're working on, I would need to prove that I paid for the VPN, but I might not need to reveal my identity. If I was logging into Signal privately, I'd want to reveal my phone number because that's what uses identifier and signal or my username, but without my phone number for telegram, uh, so forth and so on. Next. So to kind of understand intuitively how a mixed net works, uh, we have NIM, Tor and VPNs compared in this diagram. Let's start at the bottom. So you can see the packets, those, those little orange dots floating by the screen. And these packets, these the size of the packets and their frequency, um, which is the, what you could also call the timing and the volume information, is revealed by the internet itself, by the underlying internet protocol, TCP IP, transmission control slash internet protocol. So you can see that a VPN just sends all your traffic to another computer, and then that computer sends it right back out to the internet. And if I'm looking at that VPN, let's say the VPN is trustworthy, I just need to look at the data coming in the VPN and out the VPN, and I can de-anonymize packets by looking at their size and timing patterns. Now, Tor, if you go up, you can see in the middle, is much better because there's not a centralized point of control. The Tor entry node which is the first node as you go into the network, then pops you to another Tor relay and then out through an exit node. 
these guards, unless they uh, unless the entry and exit node collaborate, don't know what you're doing. And that's good. That's why Tor is always better than a VPN. However, you can see that the fundamental size and timing of the packets is still revealed. So if an adversary like the NSA is watching all the incoming traffic of Tor and all the outcoming traffic of Tor, they can indeed with some statistical luck uh, because the circuits in Tor change every 10 minutes, uh, de-anonymize at least in 10 minute burst um, the traffic patterns of Tor users. You can see what a mix that does is a bit different. So with Tor and with VPNs, when the traffic goes into them, it goes in what's called a first in, first out man manner. So the first packet that goes in is also the first packet that goes out of any given server. That's the same with Tor, same with the VPN. Now, mixed nets change this. And they, because they do, as we would say in English, what they say on the 10, mixed nets, not surprisingly, mix traffic. So when packets go into a server and a mix net, the MixNet server mixes those packets. If you want to think about the packets like a deck of cards, um, each packet is a card, and let's say they're encrypted, so they're turned over, so you don't know if it's a, you know, eight of spades or a jack of hearts or whatever. And then when enough packets go into a server, those packets are mixed. You could call it shuffle. You can think about it shuffling like shuffling a deck of cards. So the first packet that comes in is not necessarily, could be, but probably not, the first packet that comes out. Instead, maybe the second packet that comes in, the mixed nets, the second packet that uh, is the first packet that comes out, and the first packet comes out maybe as the third packet. So there's lots, and then we add fake packets, and all the packets are encrypted using what's called the Sphinx packet format. So they're the same size and their encryption is unlinkable. So this basically makes the packets anonymized. So the packets are mixed up. They all look the same. They come in and out a different order than they came in to the first nodes of the mix then from your computer. Next. So I guess the interesting thing about mix nets um, is that there, we have a different design in the classic Chami and MixNet. It's called a stop and go or continuous time MixNet. So that the, um, we'll go into that in a second, but essentially these MixNets are scalable. The latency is a bit tunable by the user per app. So some apps can be faster or slower than others. They can make one of their own decisions about uh, how much privacy they want and they're generic. So it's not just for blockchains, any application, including web browsers, instant messengers, uh, crypto, any, you know, signal or telegram, uh, they could all use a mixed net. You don't have to be a blockchain or cryptocurrency to use a mixed net. And again, how mixed nets work is that to some extent they're similar to Tor. Traffic is routed through multiple nodes and this unlinks the origin and destination of the traffic which is identified by what's called an IP address. An IP address looks like something like 255.0.147.33, essentially four numbers dotted together or if using an IPv6, something much larger. Um, and, uh, you know, by it, the IP address kind of can track you down more or less to your neighborhood, um, even down to your router if you're very unlucky. Um, and then, like Tor, we basically delink the IP address of the user from the IP address uh, that any kind of service or website sees. Now, one problem is I want to be anonymous, but let's say there's not enough people using the MixNet. Or would it just using the MixNet reveal if I'm, being, if I'm anonymous or not, if I'm trying to hide my identity? So to some extent, we can hide that by uh, adding what's called cover traffic, also called dummy traffic. And this prevents traffic analysis by essentially adding fake packets, fake information into the network. In Tor, no one else does this. It does, you know. And so 
we can essentially add more privacy, even if there's not as many real users sending packets through, because the users are always sending some packets through, even if they're not actively using the network, at least if they're online. Um, so this is, if they're not online, we obviously can't send covered traffic through. Now, the nice thing about covered traffic is that the more people that use the network, the less covered traffic you need because you have a larger set of people you can hide among. As uh, someone will explain at some point, you know, privacy is related to large extent to how many people are using the network. So if only three people are using the network, you're private among a set of three people. If 30,000 people are using the network, you're private among a set of 30,000. So I think that it's much better um, you know, to have more users than not because you have more people to hide among. Now, if you don't have that many people, you can add more cover traffic that can make you more private. But essentially, you can maintain the same level of privacy and reduce cover traffic if more people join the network. That's a really nice feature of our system. So the more, so, you know, with blockchains, the more people that use a network, the higher the transaction fees get and the slower the network gets. It's a kind of form of congestion because blockchains are essentially kind of like an auction for limited or finite block space. But, you know, MixNet is like a more like a classic web server. So this is what we call horizontal scalability. Um, unlike blockchains, MixNets can expand to allow for more traffic and that makes them more like the traditional web. And uh, point, the other point is the timing notification. I'll describe a little bit about how the MixNet works. So when packets come in, they aren't just shuffled, they're delayed. They're delayed by a process called a Poisson process. It's kind of random delay, let's say, but this is a kind of special kind of random delay, but we can predict, we don't know when any particular packet will go to the network. Some packets may actually never go out, in which case you have to send them again, but we know the average rate of a packet going out of the network. So we, and that, basically means that these packets reordering at each hop between each server prevents traffic de-anonymization. Next. So just to explain a little bit more detail, you're the user, you're sending traffic into the network that can be either TCP IP or UDP packets. You're running the NIM client on your machine, which currently is NIM Connect, if you want to download it from the website. These Packets are all transformed into Sphinx packets, all made the same size. Maybe some cover traffic is added on. They're sent into the MixNet. The MixNet has some active mix nodes, has some others that may be inactive, but at any given time period, we have currently, I think, 500 or so active mix nodes. They mix the traffic up with three hops. Each packet is sent through three, so they're all treated the same. If packets were sent through a variable number of hops, then you could use that information to de-anonymize uh, packets. That's, for example, what other uh, some other peer-to-peer quote-unquote mix nets do. And as the packets come out, they're anonymized. They're each mix the same amount, and they're all the same size, and they go to the internet, apps, services, friends, whatever. Next. So I guess the other question is, what does the NIM token do? So the problem is we need all of these mix nodes and these someone has to you know computers aren't for free someone has to pay for them and so the idea of the nim token is there should be some price for using the service that matches the demand and of course in the beginning like many things there isn't much usage so the packets uh the packets that are mixed may not be enough may not provide enough rewards to reward the mix nodes in that case um the essentially there's a sort of inflation and there's a kind of inflation schedule that's uh decays over time so that there's one billion tokens so they're ultimately deflationary uh but there is an inflation pool that rewards them a bit like the uh bitcoin mining rewards for those of you familiar with those with that system we're similar to some extent but um, we have staking, right? So mixed nodes and validators can stake NIM as part of the reputation. And we have delegated stakings. You may not, have, you may not want to run a mixed node, uh, but you may want to delegate stake to that mixed node. 
by delegating that stake, you show that you trust that mix node, you trust that they're going to be up, they're going to be mixing packets, and you get some of those rewards from that mix node. We have proof of mixing. So the 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 del remember the mix nodes, their job is to mix packets. So we have a kind of novel proof of work scheme that samples network traffic, that rewards mix nodes for mixing traffic. It guarantees fairness by taking advantage of the anonymous Sphinx packet format. Some of the edge cases of this are still under work, but we'll uh, go into those later with Claudia Diaz. And what's called a uh, value. So again, the NIM network, NIM token is approximately valued in an ideal world to the usage of the system. So if more people use the system, it would in theory uh, have some effect on the price. Um, and, and so a NIM token, if you're thinking of it as a VPN, will give you access to the VPN for some period of time. And we'll go more into that later. Next. So again, the, there's users, it's a complex system. There's mixed nodes, which are mixing traffic. And there's validators. And the mixed nodes are rewarded proportionate amount of packets they mix. And the validators ensure that there's a blockchain running. And why do we need a blockchain? We need a blockchain because we need users need to locate the mixed nodes and to find out their IP addresses and their key material, cryptographic key material that is. And uh, the blockchain needs to keep track of the reputation in terms of NIM token of every single mixed nodes and reward people. And that's done via a smart contract and what we call the Nix blockchain, which we'll go into more later. And there's service providers, which are just people which have provide NIM enabled apps. We don't imagine that most people will buy NIM token directly to access the network, but they can buy these ZK NIM credentials, have the their, you know, let's say I'm signal, I could buy a ZK NIM credential, embed that ZK NIM inside signal, and the signal would let me access the network. What for what appears to be free, but actually signals paying for it, or Brave or whoever. That's how we imagine this working. Next. So just to go into that a little bit, a little bit more detail, uh, ZK NIMS um, are essentially, you know, you can uh, what you call an anonymous authentication credential, or something's called an attribute-based credential, and they're used to access the mixnet. So if obviously, if the mixnet was just free and open to use, people could spam it. Tons of network traffic would come through. And you need, you know, that's why Adam Back invented proof of work in order to prevent spam through mixnets, like including anonymous email remailers, which were a version of mixnets. Um, we have a similar system. It's an anonymous credential system. It's a bit like privacy pass on Tor, but it's decentralized and it lets you have a lot of kind of utility. You can basically say, I get a zero knowledge proof. That's the ZK that I have paid, for example, for using the MixNet, just like I paid for using a month of a VPN. And now when I pay for something, the danger is that that payment de-anonymizes me. The very fact that I'm paying for something might reveal that I'm using it or when I'm using it. We don't want that. So the uh, ZKNIM credential system is essentially zero knowledge. So I can have a zero knowledge proof that I paid for something without revealing who I am or even which user I am. I'm just revealing the fact that I paid for it. And these are cryptographically, these credentials are cryptographically unlinkable via randomization. And they work not just with them, but with any kind of currency, including fiat. They enable selective disclosure. So you can pr 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 produce not just proof that you paid for something, but you can produce other things in zero knowledge, including you know, KYC AML information, unlinkable pseudonyms for accounts, so forth and so on, and is decentralized, unlike other anonymous credential systems, we're decentralized. No centralized third party is required to issue these credentials. It just uses what's called a threshold signature, for those who feel with cryptography, issued by a majority of the validators who are maintaining this blockchain anyways. Next. So, um, this is kind of an overarching flow diagram. And the way you want to think about it is that the uh, there's a blockchain. That's the Nix blockchain in the middle. It's 
it's uh, when you're a user, I get some token somehow, or maybe a credential for some token. These create a credential that shows I have this much bandwidth to use. I show it to the first node in the NIM mixnet. That's called a gateway. The gateway checks against to make sure it's a valid credential, but it doesn't know who or what payment that's connected to because, again, it's done in zero knowledge. Then once that's done, it accesses the, the credential lets you access the network. You can then get rewards. Uh, you access network, your traffic goes to the network, each packet is mixed, comes out through another gateway, and then goes to service provider. And at the end of every kind of time period, the mix nodes and the gateways are rewarded based on how much, how many people have used the network and any inflation pool. Next. So this is a kind of exciting system. So we have lots of people that were backed us in uh, forms of uh, other, all sorts of funding and whatnot, it includes Binance Labs, Andreessen and Horowitz, uh, Digital Currency Group, Polychain, um, lots of interesting other firms from Europe, like Kryptonite, Tioga, 1KX, uh, Swiss staking. Uh, we have exchanges that everything is on, such as Kraken and so forth, that were also interested in us. Um, and lots of validators that are running nodes. Uh, I won't go into each of them, but they're all really wonderful for doing so. Um, including some of the uh, people that backed us, like Eden Block, also run their own nodes. A lot of Asian funds, NGC Ventures, Finbushi, Hashkey, uh, and some national ones from where we're based in Switzerland. So Swiss staking, for example. And uh, yeah, we have lots of different partners and we're a pretty, uh, pretty large ecosystem, I would say. Next. So we don't know approximately how much this ecosystem is worth. Uh, but we can say it's pretty undervalued right now. General data protection markets about 70 billion, uh, growing pretty rapidly. And uh, it's mostly goes to lawyer fees. So what if technical solutions could make those lawyer fees go down? You know, we mix that's not exactly a VPN, but it's pretty close. We know the VPN market is at least 25 billion. Uh, one in eight people. On the entire planet uses the VPN, and about 30% of those VPN users say they're interested in privacy. So we eventually hope that NIM can be built in the core internet protocols and routers. Um, and of course, cryptocurrency. A lot of people are very interested in uh, privacy and cryptocurrency being at least equivalent to privacy in the traditional fiat system. Uh, you don't want uh, currently we use cryptocurrency by default unless you're using something special. Your cryptocurrency transactions are completely linkable to who you are. So I can look at your ETH account and see how many NFTs you have. I can see what your ETH balance is. I can see what your Bitcoin balance is. Pretty, I can determine that pretty quickly. And that could be dangerous. So, you know, I can't just get someone's bank account balance by looking something up on the internet. So um, we think that there's a huge possibility. And a lot of projects are very interested in integrating against NIM in the cryptocurrency market. Next. So we hope all sorts of people jump on board. We need, of course, app developers. So if you're developers, we have a grants program. We're very interested in getting people to build on top of NIM. There's all sorts of people building things like file storage systems and whatnot on top of NIM now. So if I want to share a file privately, something uh, Chelsea Manning, for example, could describe. Um, we need people to run nodes, mix nodes, and gateways. We're going to need a lot of gateways in particular. And uh, validator is going to open up pretty soon. So there's a lot of different kinds of machines you can run. And we need people just to use the network, people who want, who actually want privacy data. You can currently test the network using the NIM Connect app, which I'm sure we'll explain to people how to download and use. Next. So our current plan, you know, just for the last few years, we've launched our, uh, we launched our original system at the Chaos Computer Congress way back in 2018. We have a white paper. You should read it for all the technical details. I skimmed over a lot of stuff. We launched our main net. We got lots of funding from Binance, A16, and Polychain. Then we launched everything on CoinList in 2022 after our main net launch. 
We've done integrations with Electrum, Keybase, Telegram. We have lots of apps, mixed nodes. We started the Shipyard Academy. So this is the second round of it. We did a, another round last year. And uh, now we're interested in scaling them, including launching something that's more or less looks like a paid VPN. Um, we've opened offices in different countries, particularly um, Paris was the latest. Uh, and we're in Neuchâtel, Switzerland, for those of you who are Swiss. Uh, we're trying to have larger communities, communities in different parts of the world, China, uh, Asia in general is a big focus, uh, but also a lot of countries, South America, Africa, the Middle East. And if you want to develop, we have a great Rust and WebAssembly SDK. And we hope to really uh, launch this VPN by end of the year so people can really get a use the NIM network to access anything they want. And, you know, after 2024, we're going to focus on scaling, making the reward, making the system easier to use, looking at places that are under censorship, like Iran. We're going to try to make sure the mix that's really, really secure. We still need to use a few more audits on it and make sure the validators get rewarded and eventually go to millions of users and integrate with browsers, operating systems, apps. Again, I used to work on this stuff under Tim Berners-Lee, so I'm familiar with the whole ecosystem including standardization at the Internet Engineering Task Force and use, you know, secure key management and uh, hardware optimization as much as possible. So this means just as people would buy, for example, ASICs to do Bitcoin mining, we can eventually imagine people buying special hardware to mix more packets that could speed the network up 100 times. So that's a really big deal. And that's what uh, Chelsea Manning is working on right now. So we have an ambitious roadmap, and I am open to answer any questions. Next. Yeah, if you want to follow us, that's maybe go back and show them all the uh, following information because they may not know. Excellent presentation, Harry. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, Lazar, you can stop sharing my screen. And I think maybe we should jump into the AMA. We have quite a few uh, amazing questions from the community. Once again, I will say that uh, we will only have time for a few. We're going to, going to keep it to the less technical ones because this is, after all, the first masterclass of Shipyard. So if you have uh, any further questions or maybe your question is not answered today, then make sure to come to the AMA with uh, Jaya, myself and Hux on Friday. And there's going to be an AMA uh, all, all over Shipyard um, every Friday, I believe, or at least one per week. All right, so our first community question, um, not sure who asked it. Our data is stored by other applications, no matter how much it is said that, that it is not. Does NIM store our data? Because our data will first go to the NIM VPN uh, to be anonymous, then, we'll, then will NIM VPN store this data? Yeah, so I think it's important to remember that with NIM, your data is encrypted on your computer. That's why you have to install this kind of NIM uh, connect device on your machine. This program encrypts the data locally. Then once it's encrypted and put in what's called the Sphinx packet format, where it all looks the same, then it's sent into the mixnet. Okay? So the nice thing about that is that given the encryption happens locally, uh, even though the data is technically stored by other servers in the system, those servers have no access to data and everyone's data looks the same. So as long as multiple people are storing packets on the same server, like the system has only one user and is, is a little bit ridiculous, but if the system has more than one user, which currently does even today, um, then you cannot, the servers, they store data, but given they stored an encrypted form where everything, all the packets look the same, they don't get any knowledge from storing your packets. That being said, when you send packets to a system through NIM, the server, the other side, does decrypt those packets. So you are trusting the server at the end. So let's say I'm using NIM to access a Google service. NIM would prevent someone who's looking at my computer from knowing that I'm accessing Google. But at the end of the day, I'm sending information to Google. Google would still have that information. It's just NIM wouldn't know. Actually, the last server would know that some information is going to Google, but they wouldn't know exactly what. Makes sense. Well, NIM is just a part of the of the puzzle when it comes to privacy. We solve the network layer, and then there's all kinds of other solutions for other, other parts of the puzzle. Intuitively, you want to think of it as a pipe. So you're sending, or and if you're familiar with academia, it's called an anonymous channel. So you're sending data into a pipe. That data pipe makes it anonymous. 
But then when the data comes out the pipe, it's not anonymous anymore. But the pieces of the pipe don't have any access to what you're doing. And they prevent people that are looking at you from knowing what you're doing. And that's really the value that we give. Thanks for that answer. Uh, next one is a kind of a common question that we get, get fairly often. So um, uh, that's why this one was selected. Um, NIM project. So NIM is a truly great revolution, but um, how will you make big states uh, and organizations accept it? I guess the question here, the most important part is uh, is uh, states. Yeah, I mean, we the, the important thing about nation states is they want to spy on their own citizens almost across the board universally but they're afraid of other nation states spying on them. So originally NIM comes from a European Commission research project called Panoramics, where the European governments were upset, in particular Merkel's German government at the time, that they were being spied on by the US. So they said, can you produce a VPN that's spy proof that can defeat the NSA? And we said, yes, because we I was actually working for the French government at the time. And we did produce this system. Um, uh, they didn't. I don't think they're using it right now. Uh, in fact, we had more interest in terms of funding from Binance and others. Um, but the fact of the matter is that you know we currently still have interest from governments in using this system to defend themselves against other governments. So smaller governments, for example, like Switzerland, who are very pro-privacy, would like to defend themselves against larger governments. So you know, I do think governments at some point will have to make a choice. Will they let their citizens have privacy in case they, in that case, they won't be spied on by other governments or where they will, they want to be surveilled. And the fact of the matter is, you know, if I can surveil my citizens, other governments can surveil my citizens and that's quite dangerous. So we haven't had any pushbacks from governments yet, although we have a lot of lawyers so in case we do, we're very well prepared. Can you hear it? We can't hear you, Hux. Hux may be muted, unfortunately. Yes. We still can't hear you. Oops. Um, oh, all right. So I, I, until it's until it sorts that out, I'm gonna. Yeah, Hux yeah. I'll, I'll go to the next question. Fix this mic. Uh, so the next question is: How do apps know who is sending info uh, if the data is an anonymized? The data, the, one, the way you think about it is you choose the app. You can see this with NIM Connect when you use NIM Connect. And that app is then talked to by the NIM network. So while it's in transit, it's anonymous, but you kind of bundle up the data for the particular app you want to talk to. And the, when it gets that last node in the network, which is called the gateway, that gateway kind of sends that final packet to the app and the app debundles and they get the exact same data that you sent that you were, that was on your computer. So as long as the app supports them natively, um, they get the exact same data you would have sent without using them so that they know everything that you're going to send. Um, but in, again, in between the data is kind of wrapped up. It's like, it's like I'm sending a mail package. So, you know, I wrap, my, let's say, birthday gift locally using a box I sent it to the post office. The mailman doesn't know what the birthday gift is. Um, and using the power of cryptography, he can't open it. He just ships it, ships it. When he gets to the friend's house, my friend opens it, and it's their birthday gift. And that's kind of the same way the NIM network works. Um, now, that being said, that does depend on you, the user, having the NIM software installed and the app having the NIM software installed. That's not going to be the case for all apps. For apps that do not have the last NIM, the NIM software installed, there's kind of the last hop in the network will have to kind of open that packet, open that encrypted packet, open that encrypted package, and they will get to see the data and send it out. Uh, but, you know, assuming that data is encrypted, they shouldn't see that much. Thanks for that answer. Know, I think they would know where it's oh. going to be precise. Hawks is back. Let's see if, uh, if the mic works. We still can't hear you. Unfortunately, yeah, so another distinction. You, so this is an important distinction you might want to make between apps that have native NIM integrations, where the app actually speaks the NIM protocol, and apps that you can access via NIM but they don't speak the NIM protocol. So, for example, an app, let's say Zcash integrates against NIM directly, 
then the Zcash, let's say nodes, we don't really know too much what's going on. Uh, or let's say uh, Signal integrated them directly, then Signal itself would not know too much what's going on until we got the last hop. But there, you can also access apps that aren't integrated with NIM. But these, in that case, the last hop of the NIM network does get to see which app you're going to because they have to open that packet up and send it to the right server. It's a subtle point. Okay, next. Okay, so uh, th this uh, stuff like this, guys, will be explained in way more detail over Shipyard. So if you're interested in the technical nitty gritty, then make sure to stick around for the upcoming uh, master classes and lectures as well. I think this is going to be our last question because we, we also need to do an outro with some important information. So uh, if your question was not asked, then make sure to bring them to the AMA on Friday. Um, the question is, how easy it is to monitor someone online for a regular internet user? That's pretty easy. I mean, it depends who you are, right? So if you're using, um, let's say, Wi-Fi Internet Cafe, I can turn on a program called Wireshark. And if you don't have your, I can I can watch all the packets and where they're going. If you don't have them encrypted, I can like look at your password and get into what you're doing. And we actually did that live. Uh, this T-shirt is from Lugano, Plan B. It's a Swiss, Swiss city. We'll be there again next week to demonstrate our software and talk to folks. But we did a live demo last year in Lugano where we were in a room full of Bitcoin people and we showed them that we could uh, track their Bitcoin transactions using um, just sitting in the same room with them. And if they shot something across the network, we could see it. So it's pretty easy. You don't have to be the NSA to sort some of this stuff out. Now, the NSA or governments or Chainalysis or Google, they can watch much more than we can, much more detail because they can watch all the servers, the Internet, which I can do using a simple program like Wireshark from my home computer. But um, nonetheless, we can expect that, you know, the world, the future will be a bit cyberpunk. So that these capabilities, which were once in the hands of the NSA and only the NSA, maybe you trust the American government, but you don't trust others, will go into the hands of other governments, right? So Russia and China are now having probably greater and greater cyber, uh, cyber surveillance capabilities. We can imagine, like, you know, in the Bitcoin network, it's private actors like chain analysis. And we can imagine that these kind of capabilities will eventually get in the hands of, like, almost ordinary people to do mass internet gathering, data gathering. There are whole companies such as, what was it called? Team Simru, who, weirdly enough, are on the board of Tor, um, whose entire business model is we capture lots of data and we sell it to people. And they claim that they could do these kind of mass data gathering attacks to de-anonymize even Tor, then sell that data to folks like, the, I think they sold to the U.S. Navy or CIA or something. I'll, I'll have to check. But we can imagine that these kinds of companies and kinds of surveillance capabilities will become more powerful over time. We haven't had something like the Snowden leaks recently, so we don't really know. It's fair to say that we're just in time with them, right? Yeah, well, it's a bit, I wish we had done the software 10 years ago. We kind of knew how to build it in the 80s. We just, no one had the funding or the time. And I think the wonderful thing about cryptocurrency is that a lot of talented programmers who could be working at Google or other places are now working on privacy. And we think this is a much better and more ethical use of their time and that we do believe that the software is the, the probably the last hope we have against mass surveillance. I very much agree. All right, uh, that was the last question and one last tie for, try for Hux. Is, we still can't oh, hear no. you, man. That's okay. We'll have to fix your mic for the next meeting. Yeah, technical problems, Very technical good. problems. Glad that Hux has all the support he does for now, and I hope to uh, see you all again soon. Thanks for the whole uh, whole meeting, and congratulations on getting in the shipyard. Take care. Everyone. Don't 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 sign off so uh, just yet, Harry, because I will have uh, two more sl small questions for you. Okay. Uh, uh, Salazar, can you can you please uh, share my screen once again? 
All right, folks, so thanks for joining the first uh, masterclass of NIM Shipyard, uh, at least for this year. Uh, your secret phrase is cypherpunk. So this time around, you will not, you cannot use this in uh, Galaxy, because like I explained during the opening ceremony, we ended up ditching the level one and level two Galaxy campaigns due to the recent hacks. We take the uh, security and privacy of our uh, community very seriously. So this time around, with capital C, you can use cypherpunk, uh, the word, uh, to uh, unlock your pull-up, which I'm going to be sharing you in a second on how to do that. But but Harry, uh, this this um, word was selected uh, to basically represent a little bit of uh, your talk. Uh, to summarize it, why why do you think that is? Why why is this word relevant? Who are the cypherpunks? Well, the, the cypherpunks, and maybe we'll do another talk on them later. Were the people that took the concepts of David Chom and other academics working on mixnet and made working code out of it, and the cypherpunks work on mixnets and anonymous credentials just like us at NIM, but they also work on digital cash and they invented Bitcoin. But the way you want to think about it is that the other parts, the other software the cypherpunks were building who believe that it would be technology and not government laws that could save people's privacy and freedom, the other parts of technology they work on were mixed nets and anonymous credentials, which is exactly what we're working on. All right, thanks for that. So moving on to claim your pop, you need to um, uh, click the link uh, that is also shown on screen here. Uh, it, it, it was also, also yeah. shared in chat and just, sorry, go ahead. I said, tell people, do it fast. They have 15 minutes. Yes, exactly. You only have 15 minutes so far because it, this is a pull-up, so a uh, proof of attendance protocol after all. So um, so we want to commemorate those who, uh, who are here with us live. Um, the next steps for you, uh, we're still uh, waiting for your introductions on Telegram, uh, Discord, or Element, whichever you prefer. We've seen some truly amazing uh, introductions. I also sh also shared my own, so if you're interested in who, who I am, uh, then make sure to check out our channels. Also, do the readings. So after every uh, one of these um, uh, every one of these masterclasses and lectures and all of that stuff over Shipyard, we're going to be sharing a reading list um, with re related articles and other content that uh, Nim or others produced. And this is my other question for you, Harry. Do you uh, do you have any uh, reading for those who are um, who, who want to learn a bit more about our mission and vision, which you would suggest? I would, I would read the, the Nim white paper, which is on the. Um, on the website, basically. I think that's the, the best thing to read. If you're interested in fiction, there's a good story called True Nims, T-R-U-E-N-Y-M-S by Victor Vang, which I'd recommend people can read. Uh, but it's just for fun. I would read the white paper first for more technical detail. Fun fact, back in the day, before I joined NIM, uh, why I fell in love with NIM was the white paper. So I also highly recommend reading it. It's a pretty good overview of uh, of uh, our tech and what it stands for and uh, why it's important. All right. And uh, also, uh, as we mentioned, uh, this uh, video uh, is uh, so this will remain on YouTube after we live streamed and subtitles will be made available soon. So please bear with us until our uh, poor CMs are translating this uh, whole bunch of text for you. But uh, we want to make sure that um, that shipyard is inclusive and everybody uh, gets to participate regardless of the region they are from. And also, like I mentioned uh, a million times by now, there will be an AMA on Friday. So if your question was not uh, answered, then make sure to join us there. Thanks so much, everyone. And thanks, everyone, for joining, and see you on Friday, and also on the channels. Bye, everyone. Take care. <laughs> Bye.